Good morning, and thank you, Joe, and thank you for the invitation to, to be here. Uh, my clinical background is emergency medicine. I practiced emergency medicine for 32 years in a variety of places, such as Bellevue, dealing with very high stress situations, um, dangerous situations, but rarely have I done anything as stressful as being the speaker following Daniel. Uh. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to rise to the occasion. My, my background is somewhat e eclectic. Uh, this is my 48th year working in healthcare. Um, I started uh, as an academic research biomedical engineer um, at, at MIT and had some formative experiences there that influenced my approach to data and information and, and healthcare. My first engineering professor was Amar Bose of Bose Acoustics, who actually just recently died. First day of class, Network Theory 1, he says, um, good engineers memorize a lot. Great engineers understand the fundamentals and know where to find the data. To wit, most every exam I had in electrical engineering at MIT was open-ended and open book. It started at 6 p.m. after dinner. You stayed as long as you wanted and you brought into the room anything you wanted because if you didn't understand the fundamentals, all that was of no value. Okay. Spent five years there, I got my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering, went across the river to Harvard for medical school, okay, where the teaching philosophy about data and information was how much road can I cram into the student's head before they have a seizure? Okay, you memorized everything. It was antithetical. I challenged some of that, so I'd have discussions with, with my instructors. Uh, while I was a graduate student, I taught um, statistical thermodynamics. That's for my teaching assistantship to get through graduate school. So working with a nephrologist, I just came up with the idea that maybe metabolic disease could be modeled through state space analysis and statistical thermodynamics. And his response was, the only state and space I'm interested in is you're occupying a state and a space on the other side of the door and not coming back in my room. Now, with another physician, I suggested that technology might replace or do better at some of the physical examination things we're doing, like ophthalmoscopy. Uh, and he said I didn't belong in medical school. So things have changed. Okay. So most of my career has been looking at data, at information, and how we use it, and how is it helpful, and how can we get people to use it. So one of the themes is just because we can measure it, should we? It's not automatic. And if we should measurement, measure it and record it and store it, how do we make sure that people will use it? So those are the, my, my basic themes for, for the use of, in, of information. Why do we need to do a better job with information? Well, my, uh, my classmate, Don Berwick, who was the, the former administrator for CMS, um, published a paper a couple of years ago um, about healthcare, about waste in healthcare. And depending on the assumptions that were made, between 21 and 47% of what's done in healthcare in the United States is for things of no value. Okay. On average, 34% of what we spend in healthcare is valueless. Okay. Not a very good track record. Okay. So we need to improve that. And Don identified several behaviors and patterns that result in this waste. And one is failure of care processes. The inability to provide for the patient that which is known to be useful and helpful. The patient doesn't get it. Uh, the Institute of Medicine in a report a couple of years ago estimated that from the time something is proven to be of value in healthcare, till it penetrates in general use in the healthcare environment is 15 to 17 years. So the, the information is there, the data is there, it's just not used or it's not accessible. A second cause of waste is over-treatment whether it's because they didn't know it was over-treatment or there were other pressures to provide that over-treatment. Over-treatment is a major so source of, of waste. Uh, administrative complexity. Once you decide what to do, how difficult it is to implement it. Uh, there was an article in the journal Health Affairs a couple of years ago that compared American and Canadian physicians on interacting with payers. And the conclusion for the United States is for the average physician in the United States, the cost of interacting with payers 
is $83,000 a year. One sixth of practice revenue goes to interacting with payers because of this failure of coordination. For a Canadian physician, since it's fundamentally a single payer system, it was $21,000, but still a lot of money. I mean, how if we freed up $83,000 per physician, how much could we change and improve healthcare as, as a goal? And then the, the fourth is failure of care coordination. The area in which I'm working right now is mostly with patients with chronic diseases. That means mostly elderly patients. Okay. Patients with multiple chronic diseases on average have 12 to 14 different providers. They don't work together. They don't share information. They don't understand what the other is doing. There's repeated tests. There's unnecessary tests. All that leads to waste. So the fundamental goal here then, what we need to do to approach waste, what we can't, we won't be able to approach waste if we don't do is learn how to make better decisions. You know how to use information to make better decisions. So this same Don Berwick uh, coined the, the, the triple aim for the future of healthcare. Improve population outcomes, improve patient experience, and what he called bending the cost curve, controlling, controlling costs um, as, as, as our goal. So my, my argument would be that if we're going to do that, we have to be able to make better decisions, use information to make better decisions, okay? And the theme of what's sometimes called evidence-based or evidence-supported decision-making. In order to do that, we have to use all the data that's available to us, okay? And we have to make it to e easy to use the data. So uh, one of the um, people asked the question before is, you know, the physician doesn't want to look at that stuff. They're not, they're not capable of using it. They don't want to use it. There's no incentive to use it. Okay? It doesn't make any sense for it to collect all this data if it doesn't turn out to be useful and actionable. So that's where the theme of should we collect it, and if we collect it, how can we make it usable? So we need to make it easy for people to use that data, number one, and we need to give them a reason to use that data. And uh, Daniel was talking about in incentives. Right now, if I, a typical cardiologist, for example, is paid per procedure. The more caths you do, the more you get paid. Okay. Very little discussion of whether that cath was indicated. We're starting to see that discussion now. Okay. But if I take a, a contract to one of these cardiologists who gets paid fee for service, I said, listen, I have this deal for you. Okay. Uh, we're going to use evidence-supported decisions for every cath you do. That means you're going to do 30% fewer caths, and you're going to get 40% fewer referrals. Sign here. The response is likely to be two words that aren't happy birthday. <laughs> okay? Okay. So we need to create a system where there's an incentive for good outcomes. Now, there is a lot of pressure and development in that area, something called the accountable care organization or the accountable care-like organization, where an integrated delivery network accepts a group of patients for a fixed amount of money with the commitment to get improved healthcare outcomes and control costs. And you have examples of that that have existed for a while. The, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Geisinger Healthcare, uh, Kaiser, where they're working with, with fixed amounts of money. So like at, at, at Mayo, all the physicians are on salary. And so where they get their bonuses and incentives is when they get good outcomes. So we're getting there, not completely thorough, but we're, we're getting there. And there are lots of other changes going on that are helping us move in that direction, even though we're not there completely. A couple of years ago, for the first time, the majority of newly trained physicians accepted salaried positions rather than fee-for-service posi uh, positions. So the opportunity is there, but if we need to create that incentive to be cost-effective and clinically effective. Now, in using all the data available, we have certain advantages. There's lots of data out there. The disadvantages, there's lots of data out there, and we don't know how to use it all. All different kinds of data. So we have the typical data, the journal articles and the guidelines that are we call free text, natural language documents that, that we try to use. But it's very difficult to use them because there's so many of them. So for example, in the year um, 2010, the National Library of Medicine cataloged 699,000 new articles. I, I didn't read them all. Okay. The typical primary care provider has less than three to five hours a week to read, not because they don't want to, they just haven't got the time. Okay. And they typically read from two or three journals with which they're most familiar. So all that possibly helpful information out there never gets read. 
So what if we had a tool that was smart enough to understand this decision we have to make right now? I'm, I'm seeing this patient. I'm learning as much about this patient as I can. I have to make some decisions. Okay. Now, you know, I, I'm in a pretty comfortable area of medical practice that, that, that I'm in. I know a lot about it, but, you know, I may not be up to, uh, to everything. I may not understand this patient well enough or all that's out there that might be relevant to this patient to make an evidence-supported decision that's bet more likely to be good for this patient. Okay. If I had a tool that helped me do that and could read all those 699,000 articles and pull out from that ideas that I could use to make a better decision for this patient, that would be pretty helpful. So think of this situation. You're in your office. You're working on a challenging problem. You go next door to your, 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 your colleague and say, Jane, I'm working on this problem. The reason I say Jane is my wife has told me that women are smarter than men, so I just have to leave it that way. Jane, I'm working on this problem. I think you know, I have a pretty good idea what's going on, but I'm just not sure I've got everything I need. You know, I know you read a lot. Can you help me with this? Jane says, give me a couple of minutes. Comes back into your office five minutes later and just said, I just read 100,000 articles about your problem. And here are five ideas for you to think about when you make your decision. I'm not telling you what to do. Okay. As Daniel said, augmenting your thinking. Okay. I'm not telling you, but these are ideas that I think might be relevant to your decision. Here they are. Here's the evidence to support these ideas. Good luck. If you think that might be useful, then you like Watson, because that's exactly what Watson does. Now, Daniel showed the, 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 uh, the clip of Watson defeating the Jeopardy champions. He gave Watson a little more, more credit. He said he, he stomped them. Numerically, he did. But in fact, um, Ken Jennings, the, the final Jeopardy question on the third episode, which determined the winner, uh, was um, a double Jeopardy. If Ken Jennings had gotten that double Jeopardy, he would have won. But Watson got it. So the numerical difference, like 80000 versus $25,000, was great. But it all hinged on, on that one question. But, but thank you for, for, for helping us with that. Um, so the, the version of Watson that played Jeopardy was able to read and understand 200 million pages of text in three seconds, 65 million pages a second. So where we were developing Watson for healthcare, we started off in oncology, working with the oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering to teach Watson about healthcare. Watson has to be taught. It's a natural language processing tool. That's basically all it does. It reads and understands English. It played Jeopardy because IBM thought that was a good arena to demonstrate that Watson could understand English. Not, it wasn't built to play Jeopardy. Uh, IBM's senior leadership recognized that playing Jeopardy, playing quiz games, was not a long-term business model. Okay. Okay. So, but it, 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 if it could understand Jeopardy's arcane clues well enough to defeat these two champions, that was a clear demonstration, and, and that was the goal. But Watson learned by something called machine learning, many tools of different kinds, different kinds of data learned by machine learning. And so Watson was programmed with algorithms to help understand the English language. And then it was trained by being fed tens of thousands of previous answer question pairs from Je earlier Jeopardy programs. So Watson taught itself what a correct response looked like. Then it was further developed by being fed tens of thousands of additional answers, which were the Jeopardy form of its clue, and asked to come back with a question and told whether it was right or wrong. And then it taught itself. It improved its own algorithms, its allocation, its trust in different sources of information and taught itself how to play Jeopardy effectively. This area of, of machine learning is a recognition that we can't, as humans, always predict what we need to understand and, and learn. Okay. So what they found with Watson, the more they employed human-generated rules for understanding, the worse Watson did. So they stopped doing that and turned to this self-teaching process. Well, it was the same thing in healthcare. Watson was given thousands of electronic health records from Memorial Sloan Kettering patients with their clinical conditions and what was nominally the correct therapy. 
and then it was further developed by being given thousands of electronic health records without any choice on therapy, asked to come back with suggestions on therapy and told whether it was helpful or not. And over time, it learned well enough that it was fairly consistently coming up with therapeutic suggestions that the world's expert oncologists thought were pretty reasonable. So now Watson is going to be extended to other areas of healthcare. But that's fundamentally what it does. It addresses, it addresses free text, natural language, journal articles, guidelines, the narrative part of the electronic health record. Some of the marketing and some of the, the publicity um, from other organizations about Watson painted it as being omniscient and omnipotent. Okay. You just go up to Watson, ask a question, you get the answer. That isn't the way it works. Okay. It takes a lot to teach Watson. It really has to understand the domain. So if you have any ideas on how you would like to use Watson, the first thing you have to do is how can come up with a teaching strategy so that Watson understands what I need. And so it requires this machine learning, what's called supervised machine learning, where experts in the area help Watson understand. So that's, that's Watson in, in, in a nutshell. But that's not the only kind of information. There's all kinds of other uh, clinical data, some of it, you know, streaming data from all these these things that, that measure yourself. But so, so there are a bunch of questions in there. One is, you know, is that data really useful? So there, there's a, uh, um, a venture capitalist that Daniel and I both know in Silicon Valley and in, in, in Palo Alto. Uh, I was having a discussion with him at one of the uh, Singularity University sessions. And he said, I've got this device I can put on my, on my smartphone, on my iPhone, and it sends my EKG. I can send my EKG 100 times a day to my cardiologist. And my first response is, my typical response when somebody comes up with these devices is, uh, so what? Okay. Have you demonstrated that that's useful? Okay. So you're going to send your EKG 100 times a day to this cardiologist. Now, this is Silicon Valley. Okay. Everybody has an iPhone. Typical you know, internist's uh, roster is, say, 1,500 patients. So let's assume. A thousand of its 1,500 have iPhones. If they all have this device, this poor guy's getting 100,000 EKGs a day. Okay. What's he going to do with it? You know, so it's something you can do, but it's not clear that, that you should do. So we need to look at the data. What are we going to do with it? And how is it going to be helpful to people to use it? Because if we don't get anybody to use it, kind of wasting time. So what are other kinds of data that are out there? Well, there's something called streaming data, streaming analytics. Typically, that's when you are working with large intensive care units and you have patients monitored from multiple physiologic parameters and the data is coming at you as, as, as fast as you can get it. So one of the, my other uh, former group of colleagues uh, at IBM were working on this thing uh, on streaming analytics. And they, were, they did a project at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital um, in the neonatal ICU monitoring premature newborns. Now, there's a disease that premature newborns develop called neonatal sepsis, okay, which is, has a very high lethality. Okay. Sepsis is one of those diseases where even 15 or 20 minutes difference in starting treatment substantially changes the outcome. Using streaming analytics, they looked for patterns that would predict which patients were again in trouble before it became clinically manifest. So as I'll talk about in a little bit, all physicians, especially experienced physicians, up to a point use some sort of pattern recognition. So when I was practicing emergency medicine, um, if an elderly patient came into the emergency department who was confused, hypothermic, low body temperature, tachycardic, rapid heart rate, um, diaphoretic, sweating, confused, that was sepsis. That was a pattern for sepsis. Now, it didn't mean absolutely that was sepsis, but that was a pattern associated with sepsis. And because sepsis, survival of sepsis, in sepsis is so dependent on early treatment, okay, if I saw a patient with that pattern, I treated them for sepsis. Didn't do any tests. I treated them for sepsis. Now, in terms of how you use information, how you respond, there's a lot of conflict um, in, in, in medicine. It, and medicine is kind of resistant to change. So internists, um, and no, no offense, uh, Dan, okay, have their way of looking at information. So my internist colleagues criticized me for that behavior, saying only 30% of the patients you treated had sepsis. The other 70% didn't. Okay. So you treated 70% of the people for sepsis who didn't need that treatment. My argument would be those other 30% would have died if I had waded through the traditional diagnostic process 
um, the, before to say, absolutely, this is sepsis and I'm going to treat it. So it's a matter of perspective and how, how, do you, how to use the, the information. Um, there's image data. Okay. Again, and the kind of data we've not been very good at, at using. Typical image data, the, the cardiologist looks at the electrocardiogram and reports it out, or the radiologist looks at the film and reports it out. But there's a lot more information in that, those images and the electronic data that makes up those images than the human eye and brain can see. So w there are people who are working at interpreting the images, looking for all that data. Uh, an example would be electrocardiograms. One of my first projects back in the 60s was computer interpret interpretation of electrocardiograms. There was a cardiologist at George Washington University named Cesar Caceres, who was one of the first people who programmed the computer to interpret an EKG. He, in, he programmed it to interpret the EKG exactly the way a cardiologist does, PR intervals, QRS durations, and so on. And it turned out to be as good as an average cardiologist, but it consistently made the same mistakes that an average cardiologist made. So it may have been a little more efficient, but it really didn't raise the level of interpretation. Some people at Stanford started on the idea of looking at the, the electrocardiogram as an electrical signal, not just peaks and valleys, okay. and improved by some 60% the accuracy of interpreting EKG for basic anatomic um, uh, diagnoses. So we need to look at this data in different ways. And so my, my colleagues at um, IBM in San Jose are working on, on, on images. So we have all different kinds of data trying to use it in, in, in different ways. We need to have the viable incentives. But I think we also need to train clinicians to the new arena, the new era of, of information. When I started in medical school in the 60s, the challenge was getting information. If you wanted to read or learn about a particular subject, you went out to the library, you picked up the Index Medicus. I don't know if anybody here remembers Index Medicus. It's a volume about yay thick, comes out annually, that in, is an index of all the articles that were published in the National, uh, the listed in the National Library of Medicine. It's broken down arbitrarily into hundreds and hundreds of categories. You thought about what your question was, decided which categories it might fall into, and spent hours going through the volumes of Index Medicus and writing down on a legal pad in pen or pencil, since there were no iPads or anything like that at that time. And then you took your 150 listings over to the librarian with the hope that maybe you could get 20 of them. So you would spend two or three days to get a little bit of information. Now we're at the opposite. You go online and you get 103,122 hits in 0.12 seconds. Okay. The challenge is the information is there. I have it. How do I use it? How do I process that information to make better decisions? That kind of critical thinking, that kind of thought process is not taught in healthcare. It is taught in engineering, not in healthcare. So we need to change that fundamental dynamic. Otherwise, people are going to be scared by that data and they're, they're not going to use it. So, at MIT, I was taught to understand. At Harvard, I was taught to memorize. So biochemistry tests, I had to write down from memory the Krebs cycle. It's a cycle of about 20 chemical processes. And I'm sitting there you know, trying to memorize it and saying, why? You know, I know there's a Krebs cycle. Isn't that enough? You know, I can always go look it up. But that, so we, so that, that's going to require a fundamental change. And they're going to need to learn to, learn to collaborate, to, to work together with each other. So if we're going to use all this information okay, from the medical devices you guys developed, from all the incredible technology that Daniel was talking about, okay, we need to understand how people use information to make decisions or how we can improve their ability to use information to make decisions. So there is research out there that you know, when, when physicians make rapid decisions, it very often is based on pattern recognition. So we need to understand how people think. And so the pattern recognition. So if we're going to provide information that's readily usable, that's actionable, we might have to present it in the sense of a pattern that a physician can look at. If, if you give me all this data from your Fitbit and from everything else, and I have to look through pages, pages of numbers, that's not going to be very helpful to me. I need something that, that, that I can work with. The concern about using this information um, about it, it being responsible for that information is one of the things that leads to defensive medicine. And talk about all the waste, defensive medicine is, uh, in the United States is, is estimated to cost, uh, account for between five and 9% of what's spent on healthcare in the United States along uh, as part of the waste. So in looking at using data for 
for dis improved decision making. I have what I call the five P's. Okay. Uh, the first P is personalized or precision healthcare. That's really what our goal is. We want to be able to make better decisions for you. Okay. So you may be a diabetic, okay. but we know that 30, 20, 30, 40 percent of diabetics do not get better with the standard therapy. Okay. And the way we find that out is we try the standard therapy for a particular disease and it doesn't work. So the patient either doesn't get better or may get worse. So we stop that and we try the next one. Patient either you know, may get better, may not get better, may get worse. Stop and try the next one. How much better it would be if I could learn enough about you and what's available out there to make a better decision for you, make a decision for you that's more likely to be beneficial to you the first time around. That's where personalized is. Now, the genomics part of healthcare has sort of taken over personalized precision medicine as if it's their own. Um, that's not quite true. The first article I ever read about personalized healthcare was July 4th, 1968, in the New England Journal of Medicine. The challenge back then, and they talked about collecting all this data, understanding the patient, but they couldn't do it. They didn't have the technology to do it. They couldn't store up all the information. They couldn't get to the information. We can do that now. So the potential for personalized or precision medicine is here using all the different kinds of information available to us. The second P is prevention. Ideally, that's where we want to be. Okay? We are in a reactive mode for the most part in healthcare. You get sick and we do something about it. Okay? The goal is to prevent you from getting sick. Now, the area in which I work right now is patients with multiple chronic diseases. We do predictive analytics to identify patients with multiple chronic diseases who will get in trouble before it happens, giving their healthcare providers a chance to change the outcome. And why are we working in, in that? Well, it falls in the category of secondary or tertiary prevention. Somebody already has a chronic disease and we're tr trying to prevent it from progressing or try to minimize the acute adverse events that would require hospitalization. The ultimate goal is primary prevention, okay, prevent people from getting sick in the first place. But the challenge right now is 75% of what we spend on healthcare in the United States is for patients with chronic disease. Okay, so, you know, that's where the money is. If we're going to be able to move into broader prevention and improve healthcare, you know, more widely, we've got to save this money that we're spending on patients with chronic disease. So we are working in this area because if we can um, reduce the number of uh, you know, avoidable hospitalizations and emergency department visits and keep these patients happy, home, and, and, and healthier, then we're making a real step. So that, that's the area we work in right now, integrating um, information from home monitoring devices with the longitudinal healthcare information to identify patients who are at risk for deterioration and detect patterns in that data that would suggest two or three days from now, if you don't do something, this patient's going to wind up in the hospital to give the healthcare system a chance to, to intervene. So prevention is really where we're going. In order to achieve prevention, we have to improve our ability to predict. Okay. This is the patient who is going to get in trouble. Because we know we don't want to, if we're going to make things personalized and preventive, we need to focus on the individual. So if we apply the same preventive plan to everybody, one size fits all, we know we're going to be relatively clinically ineffective and relatively financially expensive. So the more we can focus on the individual patient, this patient, I see patterns over, we've learned, monitoring this patient for six months, we now see patterns that indicate when this patient, this particular patient gets in trouble, uh, that that's where we're going. And those patterns are important. And they're important because that's how clinicians think in patterns, and they're important because that's how we use big data, looking for patterns in that data that perhaps humans could not perceive but are, have, very high, have very powerful predictive value. And then the fifth P is persistence. Now, one of my colleagues says there's a sixth P, pervasive. For me, that means we're successful. If this kind of approach is pervasive, then we actually have been successful. But I don't put it in there yet because we're, we're not there yet, but persistence. Why do we have to be persistent? Healthcare is resistant to change. Okay. This is a, a graphic of, of how physicians make decisions. They make their quick decisions, not very scientifically based on intuition, on heuristics. Um, they, the pattern recognition, they do that quite rapidly. And then the second column is the more analytics, systemic thing, where maybe they have time to sit down and do some reading and cogitate. You know, that's where Watson might, might come in. So we need to fit in with that, but we need to get the change. So fortunately, we're not in the state of healthcare it was when I started 
medical school in the 60s where my professor told me I didn't belong there because I was thinking outside the box. Uh, but we, we still need to be uh, in, in line with that. The other challenge is the social and political environment. There's a lot of resistance to change all around us. So this is, I'll show you an easier one to read in a minute. This was taken from a bill that was submitted to the Virginia Assembly by a Virginia state senator a year ago, January. And what he said is in this bill, it prohibits performing any analytic or statistical processing with regard to any medical records from multiple patients for purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment, including population health management. Basically, he said, by law, you will remain stupid. Okay. Um, so anybody here from Virginia? You may want to think about this, Senator. <laughs> okay. So we have this, this political re re resistance, so social resistance. Um, you know, do people want all these devices? Or they, you know, how, how do you get them to participate? And the, the empowered, engaged patient is part of this. This information, again, is only useful you know, as a decision tool if the patient actually is going to engage. So the thoughts are, how do we get the patients to use this information, present the patient information in a way that they can use? Because we want them to be engaged not only in carrying out the plan, but in deciding about the plan. There's evidence out there that one of the reasons that there's so, so much problem with compliance in, in, with patients in healthcare is they weren't part of the decision. You know, there may have been you know, a physician of my generation who still has the paternalistic approach. I know everything, you know nothing, you do it because I told you to. It doesn't work. But if we can empower, make the patient more knowledgeable so they're part of the decision process, they walk away with, you know, this is me, I'm engaged in this, much more likely to, to, to participate. So some of the challenges, then again, with pers persistence is, you know, there's research on physicians and their approach to decision support tools. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of evidence of reluctance of physicians in using decision support tools. So, you know, there's a perception on the part of researchers that physicians are arrogant. It's hard for me to think of an arrogant physician, but uh, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess they're out there, okay. Um, and that physicians, as actually true for all people, are not very good at understanding their own limitations. Okay. So for example, uh, they're in the process of making a diagnosis. Um, you consider a, a bunch of different uh, diagnoses when you're trying to settle on a correct diagnosis or diagnoses. It's something called the differential diagnosis. It's a list of what you think are the, the diagnoses. Now, there are lots of human behaviors that, inf that account for decision errors. Uh, one of them is the flaw of availability, if you're just thinking about things directly. Availability means some things stick out in your mind more and more available to you because of, say, recent experience. So if you had a recent experience where you missed a very rare diagnosis and had a catastrophic result, the next time you see a patient who's even remotely similar, you're going to put that very rare diagnosis at the top of the list, even though it's very unlikely to be, be, be correct. And so you come up with your differential diagnosis rather than saying, well, you know, this is the best I can do right now, you know, but I'm, you know, I, I may well have missed something. Most physicians would take the approach, boy, I'm just so brilliant, I came up with this set of possible diagnoses, nobody else could do that. There's a lot of evidence that physicians do not understand their limitations. They don't understand their own errors, something they call meta, meta, metacognition. They're not willing to actually consider the possibility that, that their, their, their ability is, is limited. Um, a question I don't ask anymore when I speak to a medical audience is how many physicians are in the upper half of your specialty? You know, you don't see, it's, it's almost everybody. So there's one study that shows with academic professionals, 94% of them rate themselves in the top half of their profession. Okay, All right. you know, clearly a fa failure in met, met, uh, metacognition. And we have national guidelines. Things are that compilation of consensus as to what is the best treatment or best intervention right now. Very often, 40, 50% of the time, they're not followed. So we can collect all this data from how many other devices and all the wonderful things that Daniel was talking about. If nobody is going to use it, we've got a challenge. Now, fortunately, some of this is generational. Okay. So the physicians that can, you know, not my generation in, in our 60s, but the physicians in their 30s and 40s have grown up with information technology. For them, that's the norm. Okay. So they, you know, there's going to be less and less resistance to it, but it's still there, and we still have that political resistance. So all these tools, however we're going to use them, have to be developed and used in such a way 
that it's easier to use it. It's got to fit into the workflow. Now, more flexible workflow in the younger people, but it's all, it's all got, got to fit in. So what, what are the challenges to, 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 to big data? Um, big data is lots and lots of data. That, that's where we, we, we live right now. Now, not all decisions require big data. Some are pretty, are pretty simple. But big data is here. And you know, it's difficult to define. Because if, if you ask four different people what is big data, you'll get five different opinions. Okay. So uh, big data is normally described in terms of its attributes. So, and often called the four Vs. So the first V is volume, simply the amount of data that's out there. I don't consider that a particularly big challenge. Technology evolves to handle more and more data. When I got my first desktop computer in the early 80s, okay, an IBM XT, and I got the three floppy version of Lotus 123 when floppies actually were floppy, okay, you were limited to 64 rows and 64 columns. Anything more than that was big data. Okay. Not quite the case anymore. Uh, velocity, how fast that data comes out of you, how fast it's growing, okay, is, is, a, is a challenge. But again, technologically, we, can, we, we have evolved to that. So supercomputers become faster and faster. Uh, three is variety, the different kinds of data. Discuss some of it, the free text, natural language data, image data, streaming data, structured, structured data, all different variety. But again, we have the technology that can move to that. The challenge in variety is I don't want to use four different tools to look at four different kinds of data to help me with my decision making. I want one thing. So we need to integrate that, take the inferences from all the different kinds of data into one platform to allow the decision maker to use it more easily. The fourth V, I think, is the biggest challenge. Okay. And one of the reflections of it's the biggest challenge is they can't even agree on what the fourth V is. Some call it variability, some call it value, some call it veracity. Basically reflection that the more data you collect, the more likely you have data that's in conflict or frankly erroneous. So if we're using all our decisional analytic tools and our fundamental data is flawed, we've got a problem. Okay. So we need tools that can work in flawed data. And how much of that data is going to be flawed? Well, IBM estimated in, in 2012, uh, every year IBM does something called the Global Technology Outlook, which estimates where are things going to be in five years. So what they estimated is so about 2015, next year, with all the different kinds of data we have, 80% okay, of it's going to be uncertain. So you have the electronic health record that says the patient's allergic to penicillin, but another part of the electronic health record said the patient successfully got penicillin. The heart monitor in the ICU says the heart rate is 60. The blood pressure monitor it triggers on, on two peaks and says it's 120. We're going to deal with all sorts of conflicting, conflicting uh, inconsistent information, and we need to have the tools to, uh, to, to do it. So some of the analytic tools we developed at IBM in the research lab were sort of self-constraining. If the data was flawed, they were tuned to recognize the flawed data and limit their inferences, their conclusions, their recommendations by, because of the flawed data. So the way Watson handled that, for example, um, you know, Watson would read about the, the patient's case and go out and read the literature. Now, with all its machine learning, Watson would learn which sources of information tended to be more reliable. You know, nothing was perfect, but it tended to be more reliable. So it might have learned over time that the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association and the British Medical Journal and Lancet were relatively reliable. The Antarctic Journal of Nephrology, perhaps not quite so, so reliable. And so it would look at all these sources of information and, and, and review them. So it would say, OK, here's this case. Now, when I looked at the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet, they both said to do it this way but the Journal of the American Medical Association and the Annals of Internal Medicine, also reliable, said to do it this way. And I've looked at lots of journals. I can't resolve that conflict. So I'm going to bring both ideas to you with a lower level of confidence, because when Watson offers its suggestion, it's listed in the order in which it's confident that it's relevant to your decision making. So if all the major journals had said the same thing, it would come back and say, here's an idea of very high level of confidence. But there's conflict. And I can't resolve it. It's inconsistent. So I'm bringing both ideas to you with a lower level of confidence. 
And this is one of the reasons why I view this kind of uh, process as decision support or augmentation, not decision making. Because it's never completely clear. There is very rarely a single simple answer. Now, there are people who disagree with that. Um, a person that Daniel and I both know, Vinod Kozla, uh, who is a venture capitalist, the, the former uh, founder of Sun Microsystems, very wealthy man, runs this uh, a VC firm in, in Palo Alto. He believes that all these tools ought to be deterministic, ought to be prescriptive, make decisions. The way he phrases it, in the future, I want to be managed by algorithm rather than by people. Okay. Now, he and I disagree with that. Uh, on that. We've, we've had numerous discussions about it. And uh, he starts off saying, well, you know, half of all physicians are below average. And he loves doing this in a medical audience. And then he waits for, so what the hell are you talking about? He said, it's simple math. Half of everybody's below average. Okay. And then goes on, why would you want to be taken care of by a below average physician? I mean, his threshold is, you know, at least 80 percent, 80th percentile. And so machines can do that better than, than people. I, I, I don't think so. And I think so this inconsistency in the information is part of it. So he and I had a debate, um, actually at Singularity, sort of a, we were both on the platform. And he kind of agreed, well, maybe 80 percent of what physicians can do could be done by mach machines better. And wouldn't argue with that. A lot of what physicians do is kind of tedious anyhow. So I you know, got off the stage, and I thought, well, maybe I had convinced him. And one of his partners came up to me and said, oh, by the way, he just said that to make it feel good. He doesn't really believe it. So, so okay. what are the limitations of big data? What, what we look for in big data is patterns, associations, patterns in that data that is associated with the outcome we desire. Now, the limitation of big data is that we see lots and lots of these patterns but only a small number of them, a small fraction of them, actually have a causal relationship. Because when you look for lots and lots of patterns, you know, just by statistics, some patterns will appear to be statistically significant that are really random. So we need expert feedback. We need that, that supervised machine learning um, to teach us which of these patterns actually are important. Um, because you have the risk of too many correlations. And one of the problems right now, as it happened with Watson, with the hype in the media, that Watson of being omniscient and omnipotent, is the hype about big data is its own enemy. Because big data is an, an adjunct. It helps scientific inquiry. It, it doesn't solve it. But if we look at research itself, which is what we depend on when we read the journal articles, there's a, a fellow at Stanford, John Unitas, who has studied the reliability of published research. And his conclusion is much of what medical researchers conclude in their studies is misleading, exaggerated, or flat out wrong. Okay. And there's increasing concern that uh, the vast majority of published research okay, may be false. Okay. Not all of it's intentional. Some of it is intentional fraud, but some of it is just errors and so on, misinterpretation. So if the basic research that's out there that we use to formulate all of our decisions is flawed, very difficult. So we need tools that consider that. And that's, you know, so in Watson looking at the literature, that, that's how it, it did that. So if it found something in what it thought was an unreliable journal, like the Antarctic Journal, and that's the only place the idea showed up. Watson might offer that to you, but with a very low level of confidence. Because again, these tools are augmenters. They are decision support tools. You're the expert. You're the one who's going to make the decision, ideally, with the patient. These are ideas for you to think about. So I think that's the fundamental rule, role of decision support. Support, not decision making, despite Vino Kozlo's uh, you know, theory. So in, in that sense, um, what is the role of technology in healthcare, being it new devices or methods of using information? Okay. I get very uncomfortable when people say, um, this is transformative technology. I don't think technology itself is transformative. I can develop wonderful technology, but if nobody uses it, it hasn't transformed diddly. Okay. People like you, the leaders in healthcare, those are the transformative agents, the recognition that we have to change. We need to change our reimbursement model. We need to change how we measure outcomes. We need to become more personalized. Recognizing that we need to make that change and moving to make that change is what's transformative. Then when we define our strategies for making that change, we can see the obstacles we have to get there, like using the information, encouraging people to use the information, engaging patients as the challenges. Then technology becomes an enabler to help overcome those obstacles. 
But you know, the theme of, of, of technology back in the 60s and 70s when I started was you develop the technology and then find a place to force somebody to use it. It didn't work. You know, that was how electronic health records started. Actually, they were more, more oriented towards billing than clinical records. But the technology was developed and then tried to force it into, into healthcare. How many of you know a physician who says, I am in love with my electronic health record? Okay. Okay, one, not bad. Because <laughs> okay. it wasn't developed to actually be useful. So, so it, at best, technology is an enabler to help us overcome obstacles. And in the case of decision support, to augment human perception, analysis, and decision making, not replace it. So this really only fits in um, if we put into what's called a rapid learning system in healthcare. There's a fellow at the uh, University of Michigan, Chuck Friedman, who's kind of a pioneer of this idea that health systems need to learn to, 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 to get better. And while well, in the case of healthcare, rapid learning could be, you know, based on the IOM study, could be anything less than 15 years. But we do all this decision, decision analysis, decision support, we come to a conclusion, we implement it, we see what the outcome is, we feed that back, take that as new evidence, and in this rapid learning cycle, then use all this information to help make those decisions to move towards our goals of personalized healthcare that's clinically improves outcome and is economically more viable. Then and only then do all the things we've heard about, all these wonderful tools in the future, have an opportunity to actually transform healthcare, support the transformation of healthcare to what we want in the future. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marty. I know I, for one, wouldn't mind having my physician have all of human knowledge at his disposal when he's uh, checking out my, well, whatever. You get the idea. How many of you would like to have all of human knowledge available when you're being operated on? Yeah, I'm thinking so. Um, let me open the floor to questions. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris Newmarker. I'm a reporter at a NPMN. But I heard you saying a lot, you know, talking a lot about you know, it being decision support versus decision making. But you know, in the actual practice of it, uh, I could see a lot of cases where, where doctors would say, OK, the computer is suggesting I should do this. I need to do it. Um, or I, I might get sued over this if I don't do what the you know, computer is suggesting. I mean, how do you, um, you know, a lot of people aren't like really uh, intellectually courageous, you know, when, uh, when that's happening. I mean, how do you, um, I mean, how can that be overcome? Well, that's a separate but re related question because it's the same now and it's been the same that way for, for years. So when we were still in, in the textbook and printed journal phase, you know, I would collect information that I had available from that reading. You know, um, how I used that information, how courageous I was in using that information or making a decision if it went against what was printed in the book, existed then and it exists now. It's one of the reasons I think we need to change the fundamental approach to healthcare education to make people aware of how to use and, influ and how this information influ influences decision making. None of these tools, and Watson in particular, does not come back with a single answer. It comes back with multiple answers. And it's very clear in the way we developed it. These are suggestions for you to think about, not recommendations to do. It's collecting more inf information you would like to have. So when I'm dealing with a patient, I would love to have read all 699,000 articles. More particularly, I would have loved to remember what I read and use that information to make a better decision. That's the goal here. So if people kind of distort that, you know, that's, that's a behavioral problem which we need to work on, on separately. I mean, it's so much of what I was taught in medical school and residency as the only right way to do things has turned out to not only be uh, not helpful, but actually dangerous. So you know, kudos to the first person who said, I'm not going to do it this way, because you know, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that's, you know, that's all part of all the challenges in decision making. It's not changed or influenced um, in any way by these other tools we're, we're talking about. There's still that core thing of 
you know, I'm putting all the information together, I'm making the best decision I can, and going fr from there. If somebody wants to take the, you know, the short way out and say, I'm, whatever Watson or any other tool comes up as the first suggestion I'm gonna use, you know, that's a behavioral thing we need to work on. That's not a, that's not a fault of the system. Hi, I'm Alan Drossett with Box Search, and I really liked your presentation. Thank um, you. Is there any plans to do medical imaging um, instead of NLP? Or if I want to submit images, can we count things in the image? Yeah, there are a lot of people working on, on images. I think Daniel pointed out one that you know, to, to uh, diagnose the, the lesion on his neck. Um, some of my colleagues at, at, um, at IBM, at the Almadane Labs in San Jose, are working on several things in, in images. One of the things they worked on, um, it was in, in, in from an extric. <laughs> 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 um, well, if we, if we look at different kinds of information, um, one set of, of information that we use for making decisions uh, what we call a knowledge-driven decision support. The knowledge exists, you know, vetted knowledge exists in journal articles, for example. Uh, the, the other side we call data-driven decision support. It's not written up any place, but in the records of potentially millions of patients, there are patterns and information that we can use to make better decisions for an individual patient. So one of the things that um, using uh, cardiology images that um, the people at Almadane were doing was okay, looking at cardiology. I'm looking at all the images for these patients, echocardiograms, electrocardiograms, nuclear medicine studies, cath studies, okay, putting them all together. And I'm combining that with clinical information. And it's something they called uh, patient similarity analysis. I'm looking at hundreds of thousands of records. Okay, and I'm looking for patients that have the same you know, patterns in their information. I look at the, the, the images and their clinical data and their demographic data, and I'm looking at patients that are very similar across all these things, including the image data. And they interpreted the image. They didn't just take the, um, the, the written report of, say, the cardiologist. They actually evaluated the, um, the, the image itself. Because like a cardiologist can say, uh, the, 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 the anterior wall is hypokinetic, doesn't move very well but the actual dynamic of that motion has a lot more content in it. So they put that all together, and they said, okay, patients that fit into this clump, similarity in all these different characteristics, have aortic stenosis. And then they looked at the actual patients and found that a fraction of them had a different diagnosis. When they took that information back to the cardiologists, the cardiologists said they changed most of those diagnoses to aortic stenosis. So there are lots of people. There are people you know, working on neuroimaging, um, you know, the whole arena of neuroscience and doing neuroimaging, interpreting images to try to uh, understand behavioral and, and uh, neurologic diseases better. So there, there are lots of places. UCLA has a neurosciences center, for example, where they're looking at uh, uh, neural imaging to see you know, what parts of the brain light up and what doesn't light up when certain events happen. So it's, it's all over the place, just recognizing that that kind of image information, which we've never been able to use well before, um, is going to be uh, very important. Mark, very good. Um, I'm a fan of yours, and I'm, I'm hoping Watson uh, really moves forward in healthcare. Uh, Rick Satava from the University of Washington. Uh, you made the statement that a lot of the data that research you provide is flawed, and I concur with that uh, very much so. But that's what Watson is using to make decisions. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are the consequences of Watson suggests a particular format? This physician, in his experience or her experience, says, mm, I don't think that's right. Goes with their hunch, their intuition, mm -hmm. and they're wrong. Now we've got all this evidence from Watson that he should have done one thing based on guidelines and standards but the physician had gone ahead and done something different. Uh, again, that's not specific to, to Watson. Okay. First of all, Watson doesn't make recommendations. Watson offers ideas for you to think about. And it, 
it, it lists them in the you know, order which it's confident that it's relevant to you. So it's very specifically meant to help you make a decision, not direct your decision. And in a sense, it's not any different than if you went online and used the online version of Harrison's textbook of medicine. You, know, you search on a problem, you get innumerable hits, and there'll be lots of conflict. You're going to use that information to make a decision. So yeah, it may be a bad outcome. But ultimately, you know, I remember I had that, uh, that um, th 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 the, the arrows didn't show up with the wrong color off to change the color on them. Um, but in that rapid learning system, so that would be a bit of information. You made a decision based on the information you were given. It had an adverse outcome. That gets fed back into the system to improve knowledge later on. Because mistakes are going to happen. Bad outcomes are going to happen, even if you make the right decision. You know, so some of those patients I treated immediately for sepsis still died. You know, it doesn't mean I did the wrong thing. So that's why none of this really matters in the long term unless it's part of the rapid learning system. And that's where that would have to fit in. Thank you. Time for one more question. Hi, uh, Neha Sagal uh, with a with a, sorry, with a healthcare technology incubator, in El Paso called Red Sky. The average person is, um, is becoming their own clinical research investigator um, without really any formal training or background. How would you put a value on that consumable? Actually, that's going to be progressively more important uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, because one of the tenets of big data, besides all the problems, is that there's no such thing as too much data. So the more we can get in different kinds of forms, the, the, the better chance we have. So I was at a, a, a conference at the NIH in 2010 that they called Networks of Networks, and they discussed the future of healthcare research. And their conclusion, for a variety of reasons, and I'll dis discuss a couple of the reasons, was that in, in the future, more research is going to be done with real-world data, using existing data that's collected and used to learn about patients and problems. One of the reasons that they, um, they, they said that is the traditional double-blind randomized control study that's been the cornerstone of, of research for decades is becoming more and more difficult to do. It's very expensive. Okay. It's hard to, col to, to collect uh, patients you know, for the control group and, and the treatment group. Um, it's hard to collect researchers who are willing to participate. It's a very rigorous, unpleasant process. An article in the Journal of Health Affairs described it as being so challenging that 85% of the physicians who participate in, in an RCT do so only once. Don't want to be any part of it again. Uh, but, and so you can spend millions of dollars, go through a couple of years, and come up with nothing. Okay. But there's a new challenge now, in part because of social media and, and the web, that they found is they finally go through all this effort and they collect their patient populations and they have their control group and they have their treatment group and they have a you know, a solid firewall to, so the double blind holds up. Then what happens is these patients go out into, into the social networks like you know, uh, WebMD or patients like me, and somehow they find other people in the study. And they say, well, gee, I spoke to two people in the study and they had this side effect. I didn't have any side effect. I must be in the control group. The hell with this, I quit. <laughs> and so they can't even, once they do it all right, they can't get uh, the, so the idea that there's data on millions, hundreds of millions of patients out there. Okay. Okay. We can learn so much from looking at patterns in that data that they think going forward, something like the patient similarity analytics you know, that, that I talked about will be a fundamental method of research. So if that data is collected and stored and accessible, now accessible you know, is going to be one of the real challenges because of all the medical legal issues. and and concern about sharing data. But if all that data is accessible, then that's a long way towards the idea of personalized or precision medicine. If I can, you know, if I have this patient in front of me, and I can describe this patient with many characteristics, and I can go out there, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, data, about hundreds of millions of patients, and I can find a cohort of patients that are very similar to my patient, and look at outcomes and, and so on for that group, well, that's a lot of very important information that I can use to make a better decision for that patient. So I think that stuff is going to be more and more important in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marty Cohn.